Now, Mr. McGee asked me to talk to you today and try to answer this question. Give three reasons why we should care about the death of President John F. Kennedy. You guys been talking a little bit about that? Talk about his assassination and all? Anybody? You spoke any time on that? Well, if you were watching TV at all this past November, it was the 50th anniversary of President Kennedy's assassination in Dallas. And there were programs after program after program after program on that. Some believable, maybe some not so believable. It's been an incredible story for 50 years. So off the, I'm, going to give you, I'm going to give you 13 reasons why we should care about the death of President John F. Kennedy. But the first reason, it really isn't even a reason, it's a statement, is if people are thinking about this, and talking about this and spending the amount of time they spent on documentaries 50 years after this man was killed, would that be a good reason about why we should care about his, about his death? 50 years later, people are still talking about this man and his tragic death and doubts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you 13 reasons why you should care about the death of President John F. Kennedy. Here is President Kennedy right here. Okay? Now, you guys, I don't know what you know, you're pretty young. I was five years old when President Kennedy was assassinated, and I'm 56 now, so it's been a while, okay? But I was five, and I'll tell you that story in a minute. But do any of you kids in here know enough about John F. Kennedy that you might give me one of your reasons why you think that we should care about his death? Yeah? He cared a lot about the people. Okay, example. Uh, when he was going through Dallas... He had his car stopped so he could go and shake the hands of small children. Very good. How did the Secret Service feel about that? Oh, they did not. <laughs> and she is right. Miss Winder is right. He was a people's person. And we'll kind of get into this if you get into class. But the presidential limousine at that time had a bubble top on it. And it was not bulletproof, contrary to popular rumor. It was a, it was a cover to keep him out of the weather and keep him semi-protected. He did not want that bubble top on that limousine when he went through Dallas because he wanted the people to see him. Okay? He also did not want and ordered the Secret Service agents off the back of his car. If you look at the President's car in 1963, it had jump rails where the, the agent could get on the rail and hang on and ride on the car. Or they could walk beside the car. The car was going too fast for him to walk, but he ordered the agents off. He wanted to be accessible to the people. That's a very... Very good point. Okay, so he did care about what people thought. He was more of a people's president. So that is, that's a good reason, and we'll talk about some of that. Okay, anybody else have any other thoughts? Um, didn't he try to uh, begin desegregating the country? Very, he was the first president to begin an honest effort at desegregation. That is very good, and we'll talk about that. That's one of my 13, and we'll go into a little more detail. Okay. Do you understand civil rights, kids? We'll get into that in a minute, but I, I want, we're going to get some stuff on it. Okay, anybody else have any? And then maybe if I start and you think of one, go ahead and raise your hand. My first reason that you should care about his death is he was a very famous author. Very famous author. He wrote two books of notoriety. The first being, Why England Slept. Here is a first edition, first printing of Why England Slept. This, if, you, if I sold this book, I could pay your lunch bill for two years. They're very rare. Why England Slept. It was a book that Kennedy wrote off of his thesis when he went to graduate school. Now, when you go to graduate school, anybody know what a thesis is? Really long term paper. So long that a lot of people publish their thesis into a book. And that's what he did. Anybody want to know what this was about? Anybody want to guess what, why England slept? What do you think that was about? What did he write his book about? You think he was worried about England falling asleep at the wheel? Kind of. It was about how unprepared England was during World War II. He studied that. He studied the lack of preparation that England had in World War II, and he wrote a book entitled Why England Slept. Was it a bestseller? Ah, not so much. Is it worth a lot of money now? Yeah. Because <laughs> there's not a lot of them around. 
The second book he wrote, of very big importance, was a book called Profiles in Courage. Profiles in Courage. Okay? This book right here. Written in 1955-56 first edition. This book ended up winning the Pulitzer Prize for Journalism in 1956. Is that a pretty big deal? Would, you, would your name kind of get out there if you won the Pulitzer Prize for Journalism? Mm -hmm. Profiles in Courage. Anybody want to guess what this book was about? Courage. Courage on the part of eight Americans. Okay? And sometimes referred to as eight courageous Americans. He went into history and found eight Americans that did something very courageous, despite the consequences of that. I'll give you an example. You, maybe you got this. You got U.S. history, didn't you, in the eighth grade? Yeah. Right? Okay, anybody remember what happened after Lincoln was assassinated? Anybody know who took over the presidency after Lincoln was assassinated? I'd be surprised if you did. Wasn't it the secretary? It was the vice president, but who was it? Okay, Andrew Johnson. Lincoln was a northerner, Johnson was a southerner. So the northerners did everything they could to get Johnson out of office. And how do you get a president out of office? You impeach them. And who votes on impeachment? Who, who votes to impeach a president? The House of Representatives, Congress, the House of Representatives. Because Congress consists of the House of Representatives and the Senate, right? Okay, the House of Representatives impeached Johnson. That means they put him on trial for impeachment. Who votes on whether he's kicked out of office or not? Not the, not the House, but the Senate. Senate. Now, you have to do that by two-thirds majority. It just isn't a simple majority. Two-thirds of, of the Senate have to say impeach before you're gone. Make a long story short, a fellow by the name of Edmund G. Ross, it, he was a senator, it came down to his vote whether Johnson was impeached or not. His vote would make two-thirds majority. So you know that almost two-thirds want him out, and only about a third want him in. So if he votes to impeach, he's got a third of the people mad at him. If he votes not guilty not to impeach, he's got two-thirds, including he's from the North. So what are the Northern Senators going to expect him to do? Vote for impeachment. Guess what he does? He votes his conscience on what was right, voted not to impeach, and his political career was over. But John Kennedy felt he was one of the top eight courageous Americans in the history of our country, and he wrote a chapter about it. Very popular book. And uh, I'll tell you another quick story, and then I'll answer your question. He had so many requests for people to sign, for him to sign his book, that he had his secretary sign. And now you have to be careful when you buy a Kennedy signature because you might get a secretarial. And very hard to tell. They even wrote a book on how to tell a real JFK signature from a fake one. If you're interested in seeing a real JFK signature, I actually have one hanging in my office that's worth about $15,000. And it's on a piece of paper about that big. And it says, cordially, Jack Kennedy, which is what his friends and family called him. That was his nickname. About 15 grand. Do you want to see it? Come on in. Anyway, can I have a question now? Uh, what was that guy's name again? Edmund G. Ross. Yeah, Edmund G. Ross. So, I've only given you one reason they should care about his death, and we spent 10 minutes on it. He was a famous author. Second, he was a war hero. Oh, yes. Anybody know anything about this story? He was the commander of a torpedo boat entitled PT-109. Does anybody know what a torpedo boat does in the war? It's a really tiny little boat with a crew of about 15 guys. Torpedoes. Shoots torpedoes. No, that's what you would think. It's a boat that goes out and warns big battleships of where submarines might be or other battleships. It was the, it was the escort for big battleships. So would it be a dangerous job? Yes. And what happened... In the middle of the night, in the Pacific Ocean, when John Kennedy served as, as the commander of PT-109, a Japanese destroyer, which is a very big boat, did not see Kennedy's little tiny boat, and it ran right into it and cut it right in half. Started it on fire and left him and his crewmen in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the ocean, hanging on to wreckage. And what he did, to make a long story short, is he swam his crew to safety and won a, won a, won a medal for that. Now, one of his men was injured severely, and he actually swam or swam. Mr. McGee's not here, so we might be slang here. 
But he put this soldier, sailor, on his back and swam him to a nearby island several miles away. It hurt his back, and for the rest of his life he, severe, he suffered serious back issues, okay, because of that. But he was a war hero. Third reason, he was a very wealthy, he came from a very wealthy, prominent family. Very wealthy, prominent family. At the time John Kennedy was president, I don't quote me on this, but I think the presidential salary was maybe a hundred to two hundred thousand a year. He's the only president that I'm aware of that donated his entire salary to charity. Okay? Very wealthy man. His father's name was Joseph Patrick Kennedy, and he was very, very wealthy. And he made his money in about three different ways. Now think about this. He grew up, his father, you know, his father was 29 years old in the roaring 20s and 30s. What do you think he made his money doing? Joseph Kennedy Sr. Investing. Investing in what? He's right. Two things he invested in. Stocks. Not slaves. What else did he invest in? Stocks is correct. What else can you make money if you invest in? We'll use oil as kind of stocks too. Okay, stocks and... Okay, what else? Anybody know? Roaring 20s. What else did he invest his money into? Oh, cars. Not quite cars. Huh? Real estate. Bought a lot of real estate. He also actually invested his money in the movie business when they had silent movies. Okay? But guess where he made the most money? And if you did this, it's it's it was not even legal. How did he make most of his money? Bootlegging alcohol. In the Prohibition times, in the 1920s, when alcohol was illegal, very good young lady, when alcohol was illegal, he sold alcohol illegally, just like you'd be if somebody's selling drugs right now, illegally. He made a fortune. He wasn't the moonshiner. He wasn't the one that made it, but he's the one that sold it. So he was a rum runner. He was a, he was a guy that did that, and he made a ton of money in the illegal alcohol business. That's where he got most of his fortune. Now, Joseph Kennedy was an interesting fellow. He had two quotes for his family or for his family members, and he lived by this. The first quote was, the world is a rough place for losers. He did not want his kids to finish second in anything. You were to be first in everything. You win everything you attempt. It wasn't until 2000 that a Kennedy lost an election when Robert Kennedy's daughter lost the governorship of Maryland it was the first time a Kennedy had ever lost an election. Joseph Kennedy, the world's a rough place for losers. You will not be second in anything. You will be first. And he wanted his family to refrain from the show of emotion. His family creed, and he meant it, Kennedy's don't cry. Kennedy's don't cry. You, they, there are so many tragedies in the Kennedy family. Deaths. Early deaths. If you go to a Kennedy funeral, there's not anybody crying from the family. That is the rule. Okay? So that's the third reason why we should care about the death of John F. Kennedy was his family. The fourth was the election of 1960. Now, I don't know how astute you kids are at freshman level to know about presidential elections. But in a presidential election, you have primary elections and then you have a general election. So in, in today's... votes as well? What's that? Well, we'll get to that. So usually you have two political parties normally. You have the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. Yes. And the Democrats go find their candidate and the Republicans go find their candidate. They have a convention and they vote on that candidate. And then they run against each other. In this particular case, President Kennedy was a senator from Massachusetts and he ran on the Democratic ticket... Okay, he, was a junior, he was a senator, and he ran against the vice president of the United States, Richard Nixon, who served as vice president under Dwight Eisenhower, who served, served two terms, very popular president. So most people thought that Nixon would win because he was not only the vice president, but he was a member of the Republican Party. Now let me tell you a little bit about party politics. Most, in most presidential elections, 75% approximately, if you ask them, would say they're Republican in this country. And about 25% would say they're Democrat. Okay? So if the Democrat is going to win the election in the White House, they've got to get their 25% plus 50% of the 75% that say they're Republicans. 
So it's a little bit more difficult. So everybody knew this was going to be a close election. Okay? You had a young, upstart, handsome candidate in John Kennedy versus Richard Nixon, who was about the same age, who had great political experience as vice president. This was also the first election that would be battled on television. Okay? In 1950, four million people had television sets in their houses. In 1960, that rose to 44 million. So, people watched the presidential campaign on TV, and they watched the great debates between Kennedy and Nixon. They had a series of debates on TV. Now, everybody knew this was going to be a close election, so I don't know if you have any mathematicians in here, but I'm going to show you how close it was. Here's the popular vote in this election. 69,084,314 people voted in this election, 1960. Okay? Out of that popular vote, Kennedy wins by 118,574 votes. That seems like a lot of votes, except almost 70 million were cast. So here's the percentage for you math majors here. Here is the percentage that Kennedy won by. What is that? Any math majors in here? How much a percent is that? Oh, wow. One thousand, one thousandth of one percent, right? Would this not be one percent right here? Zero percent. If I had a one here, that'd be one percent, right? It's not even one. Yeah. How close is that? Second closest election in American history. And Kennedy wins the election. Now, I somebody back there, Miss Winder, I think was going to steal my thunder, but I'll stop her. Popular votes and a dollar. What's it cost for pop? Do you buy a pop and pop? Okay. Popular votes and a dollar twenty-five will buy you a pop in the pop machine, which tells you what. Popular votes and a dollar twenty-five will buy you a pop. So if you don't have the popular vote, can you still get a pop? Yeah. So they don't mean much, do they? If you have, if I have a dollar twenty-five, I can get a pop. So if I say popular votes and a dollar twenty-five will buy you a pop, do you need the popular votes to get the pop? No. No. So they don't mean anything. What is the key to an election? Electoral, Electoral votes. Now here's how this works. So you know, it's good off topic, but it's good information for you. States are given electoral votes depending on what? The number of size, population. So Montana and Wyoming don't have very many popular votes, but New York has lots of popular votes. Mm -hmm. You have to have two-thirds majority of the popular, or excuse me, the electoral vote to win an election. So if there's 500 electoral votes possible, in order to win that election, you have to get .667 of those votes. Okay? So do can presidential candidates spend a lot of time in Montana campaigning? Yeah. Or Wyoming? No, because they're not worth much. Anyway, back on track, because this was the closest election in American history, and because, second closest, and because Kennedy won, he became two things. The youngest man ever to be elected president at 43, and the first Roman Catholic ever to be elected president. Question. Yes. Didn't he have a hard time getting elected because he was the first Catholic and they were afraid that the Pope would be running the country, so to speak? That, that's, what the, that's very good, Ms. Winter. That's what people pointed out there, but un, unbeknownst to them, 44, four, I got let me think on this, 18% of the America was Catholic and like 44%, they're like 44 million, now I got to think about this, mess up, there was a high percentage of African Americans and a high percentage of Catholics that voted for who? Kennedy. Kennedy. Okay, I'll get, I don't have the stats right on me, but anyway, the point being, that was talked about. He had to overcome his age and his religion. And he answered the religion question all the time. Because there were people that thought that the Catholic religion would be run the country. Now, I don't want to make anybody mad or uncomfortable, but I'll make a comparison. Who ran the last political presidential election against Obama? No. Romney. What's his religion? LDS. He's LDS. Were there not similar comments made? Yes. Yes. That if Mitt Romney wins this, the LDS church will be running the country. That was as stupid as when they said that about the Catholics in 1960. But did it influence some votes? Maybe, maybe not. But there's a lot of members of the LDS church that voted in this election. Do you think they voted for Barack Obama? No. 
Probably not. So you can look at it both ways. But anyway, it was a very interesting election of 1960. Kennedy is elected by the second narrowest margin in American history. He's the first Roman Catholic and the youngest man ever elected. That's another reason why you should care about his death. Okay, the fifth reason is Kennedy's inauguration. You know what an inauguration is? A very long way. It's when he gets sworn into office. Now, normally in Washington, D.C., in January, toward the end of January, what is the weather like? Cold. Cold. Uh, not really. No, it's pretty, pretty mild. Usually it'd probably be in the 40s or 50s, maybe even more. Not, not in 1961 in January. It had snowed. The largest amount of snow dropped in the, in the nation's capital in its history the night before the inauguration. Mm -hmm. So it was an unusual inauguration because they had to make preparations for the snow to be removed, which was not easy in a big city. And when the president spoke, what did you see? His breath, which was very unusual for them, everybody to be all bundled up and, all you, see and you could see his breath. Mm -hmm. Look at Obama, President Obama's last inaugural. Are there people bundled up and bundled up in, in uh, winter clothes and scarves and gloves? No, because it wasn't that cold. So that was unusual. Then Kennedy gives probably one of the greatest inauguration speeches in the history of our country, and he ends it with, "Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country." Ask what you can do for your country. And what he's saying there is, don't be looking for what. Your country can do for you. What can you do to make this a better country? He also re uh, referred to the younger generation of Americans. Remember, he needed to get people on board that were younger because he was the youngest man ever elected. So his speech is another reason in his inauguration that you should remember or you should care about his death. The seventh reason, Six. sixth reason, thank you, is the Peace Corps. Peace Corps. Oh. Okay, let me, anybody know what that is? Sounds familiar. Oh, isn't it the group of people he sent over to other countries to help do things with the people so that we weren't just sending soldiers and such? Over? Well, not so much soldiers. Don't get that confused. Mm -hmm. Kennedy was interested in helping underdeveloped countries. These are countries that do not, you want to take over? <laughs> that do not have, they're not real civilized, okay? And Miss Bird, who did President Kennedy pick to head up the Peace Corps? Uh, Sister in law? Well, you're going to get an F. Brother in law. Brother in law, what was his name? Mm, Mr. Brother in law. His name was Sergeant Shriver. Shriver. He was president. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you you on my list. V, right? I better get out of here before I ask okay, you something else. That was like 10 years Sergeant Shriver was the president's brother-in-law, and he put him in charge of the Peace Corps, and what they did is they enlisted youths to volunteer and help in underdeveloped countries. Help them do such things as what, Miss Bird? Um, improve education? Improve, improve education. Improve health Improve health care. Improve health care. Oh. Improve agriculture by teaching them how to plant crops. Thank you. Plant, plant crops and, and live for themselves. They were a little bit primitive. You see what I mean? They didn't live in cities. And so that was a very successful program that still exists today. Yep. Now, when they first did it, youths out of college volunteered. Who are a majority of the Peace Corps volunteers now? Older. Old farts like me. There are older people that have retired that want to help. Okay? Seventh reason you should remember President Kennedy's death was not a positive reason. It was an event called the Bay of Pigs. Oh. Bay of Pigs. <laughs> and what that was is during this time in the 50s and 60s, after World War II, the United States was very concerned about communism and Russia and communist countries. And Cuba was less than 100 miles away from Key West, Florida, and Fidel Castro, a communist leader, was running the country. And we wanted to kill him. We wanted to assassinate him. We wanted him out of there. So President Eisenhower put together a plan to train Cuban exiles. These are people that were kicked out of Cuba. They trained them. The CIA trained them for an invasion of Cuba with the goal to start a revolt and assassinate Fidel Castro. 
It was a pretty good plan, they thought. Well, Eisenhower went out of office before he had a chance to implement it, so who does, whose decision does it become whether they're going to continue it or not? Mm -hmm. President Kennedy. And so he studies it up, and he thinks it might be a good idea, and so he decides to go with it, but he wants to know what our commitment's going to be. And our commitment was that we were going to provide air support so when the exiles hit the beach, they would have a chance to get where they get, need to get to the landing site. We also were going to mop up afterwards. After it was all over, these people revolted against Castro because they didn't like him anyway, and we'd assassinated Castro. And we were going to bring troops in to mop up when it was over, and we were going to commit to, to Castro's assassination. Okay? Well, as this plan began, Kennedy got nervous. And it failed miserably because he failed to produce the air support that they needed. And those exiles were just crushed on the beaches. Many of them killed, many of them captured. Kennedy, President Kennedy messed up. And the reason why he decided not to supply the air support at the last minute is his brother Bobby, who was his attorney general, who was his close advisor, said, you know, this is a bad idea. We cannot be involved in the political assassination of another country's leader ironically. And so they pulled the plug and the exiles were, many were killed and many were captured. Kennedy, who easily could have pushed the blame on else, basically stood up in front of the American people and said it was his mistake, he took full responsibility, and we paid fifty million dollars in 1962 for the return of those exiles safely back to the United States so they would not be persecuted in Cuba. So Kennedy's first uh, attempt at foreign relations and communism turned out how? Yeah. Not very good. But it is a reason why you should care about his death. And we'll talk about how he redeems himself later. Bay of Pigs. Number eight, the Berlin Wall. Anybody know any history behind the Berlin Wall? It was. What's that? Who somebody said something? Yeah, what is it? I just said the Iron Curtain. Close. That's another name for it. What is it? Anybody know? They need to know. No, it's okay. You should. Except you're only freshmen. East Germany from West Germany. More specifically, you're right. But more specifically, Berlin. East Berlin from West, West Berlin. Berlin. After World War II, there was an international agreement that divided Germany right in half. I mean, right in half, and right in half went right through the city of Berlin. The eastern part of the city and the country was communist. The western part of the city and the country is non-communist. They actually built a wall a hundred miles long to separate that. And if you were in the communist side, you were stuck there. If you were in the non-communist side, you were there. Well, there were a lot of people who didn't really want to be on that communist side. And President Kennedy didn't like that Berlin Wall. And so he met with Nikita Khrushchev, who was the premier of Russia, who was kind of spearheading this communist movement and tried to do some negotiations to no avail. And Kennedy's comment, disgustedly but true, is a wall is better than a... Starts with the same letter. A wall is better than a war. And so he lived with that. And it finally came down in 1989. Okay, went up in the 60s, came up in 89. He went there after the wall was constructed and gave one of the famous, most famous speeches ever to the people of Berlin and basically stated that he too was a Berliner. All free men are from Berlin. All free men are Berliners. He was incredibly popular in Berlin. Incredibly popular. So anyway, the Berlin Wall was another reason why you should care about his death. The ninth reason was the race for space. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, he started the race for space, sort of. Actually, during the Eisenhower years, the Russians had set up, set up a couple, uh, set up a satellite. They sent a guy into space, and we were scared to death, thinking, "Man, if they can send this up into space, what could they do from a nuclear weapon point of view?" So we thought we better get going. And so Dwight Eisenhower established NASA, the space program, and then Kennedy inherited it and took it to a new level. And the first space program under NASA was called the Mercury Project. And they, they, they asked the branches of the military to give them their best pilots. And they had a list of 509 pilots that they eventually cut down to seven. And those seven became our first astronauts, and they were known as the Mercury Astronauts. And they had to have a combination of skill and physical fitness and knowledge. They had to have the right 
these seven astronauts had to have the right stuff. stuff. Okay, <laughs> that's even a movie. And so they were picked from 500 plus possibilities and became the first astronauts. Each of them flew a mission except for one. Okay, which led us to the Gemini program, which led us to the Apollo program, which led us to the space shuttle, etc. Okay, so he was he was should be remembered in death for his efforts in the race for space. He should be remembered for 1962, because some interesting things happened during his presidency in 1962 that really didn't have anything to do with politics, but people remember it. Now, we just had the 50th anniversary of this just the other day on TV. Anybody know what it is? 50th anniversary in 1964, when who came to the United States for the first time? The Beatles. And they appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show. In 1964, but they cut their first album in 1962 during the President Kennedy's administration. And Ed Sullivan, who had a variety show, kind of like Jay Leno or Johnny Carson or or David, uh, what's his name, Letterman. The, one of the first ones was the Ed Sullivan Talent Show, and Ed Sullivan talked the Beatles into coming to America, and people went crazy. Beatlemania started then. Also in 1962, you ever heard of a guy by the name of Wilt Chamberlain? Yes. Who's Wilt Chamberlain? Wilt the Still Chamberlain. He was even taller than you, Cody. He was seven foot tall. He was the tallest player in NBA history in 1962. Played for the Philadelphia Warriors. You know what he did against the New York Knickerbockers in 1962 in one game? He scored 100 points in one game. Just him? Just him. Whoa. Still an NBA record. St I mean, that lasted 62, 72, 82, 92, 2002, 2012. 52 years, that record. And we have the three-point shot now. A hundred points in one game. Okay? Now, the most important thing about 1962 on number 10 and why we should remember his death is according to public opinion polls, President Kennedy was at the height of his popularity in 1962. Why was he, why was he so doggone popular? What was, give me some reasons why he was so popular. Come on, you're doing good. Better, better way better than I thought. These two haven't even said much, although McGarvin pulled off the Beatles question. Cockrell, I gotta groom you, man. You're gonna promise your mother I'd take all of her kids through this class. Okay, what, what would make Kennedy popular? Very young and handsome. Okay, we had never had a 43-year-old president. No offense. God bless Dwight Eisenhower, but he looked like somebody's grandpa, man. So now we bring in President Kennedy, a handsome dude. Not only does he come into the White House, his wife, who is as pretty as you can get, before the, before you had the expression, man, she's hot. She was hot. Okay? <laughs> Women changed their hairstyles to look just like her. They dressed like her. She was very pretty. So we had a handsome president and an incredibly pretty first lady. What else did they bring with them? Two, Two children. We hadn't had children in the White House for years. Two little children. Okay? So I'm telling you what, they were popular. And I'm going to tell you something about President Kennedy. President Kennedy was pretty hip, kids. Oh, whoa. Pretty hip. He wore Ray-Bans. Matter of fact, he had a pair of Ray-Bans. Matter of fact, these were his Ray-Bans. This is one pair of his Ray-Bans. Really? Yeah. I got these from Harry McCormick, and I'll tell you that story later in your life. Huge Hinton Kennedy collector, big-time friend of mine, gave me these glasses. I can't tell you whether he wore them. I can't tell you where he had them, but I can tell you these were his. First president to wear sunglasses in public, man. He was pretty hip. Which takes me to my next subject of this. He had a birthday in 1962. And Peter Lawford, who was an actor who is his brother-in-law, set a big birthday party for him in Madison Square Garden in New York City in 1962. And he had a special guest come to sing the president happy birthday. Marilyn and she Monson. sang it like, happy birthday. Mr. President. Marilyn Monroe, the absolute sex symbols of the 60s, sang Happy Birthday to President Kennedy. And after she did it under the influence of every barbiturate possible, he said, I'll rest 
easier now knowing I had happy birthday sung to me in such a wholesome way. She had this dress on. It was nude colored dress. They built the dress, sewed the dress. She had to have it sewn on her. They didn't sew it and then she put it on. They, sew, they sewed it on her. That was that time. Dress sold for 1.2 million, by the way, later on in history. Anyway, sexiest woman alive sang happy birthday to him. So my point is, he became one of the first presidents to be celebrity status and had a lot of Hollywood friends, such as Frank Sinatra, yes. Dean Martin, your grandparents will know these names. <laughs> he was a big fan with the Rat Pack. Anybody know who the Rat Pack was? Hollywood actors, Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr., who was black, who was treated more white than black in a time when blacks were treated poorly. Joey Bishop, he was a member of the Hollywood elite. Kennedy was very popular with celebrities. What other recent president did we have that was incredibly popular with celebrities? Bill Clinton. Unbelievably popular with celebrities. Okay? So, now, the last thing under 1962 when we talk about Kennedy be at the height of his presidency was the Kennedy wit. What does that mean? Kennedy wit. If you're witty, what are you? Smart. Kind of funny. Smart. Well, you can be kind of smart. But Kennedy had a great way about him. When people would ask him questions, you know, he could get offended maybe. He turned the wit around. He was so popular with his wit that Richard Adler wrote a book called The Kennedy Wit, which is just full of quotes of his that were kind of funny. And that book sold so well, he wrote a sequel called More Kennedy Wit. I'm not kidding you. He had a sense of humor. Now, this is not going to be funny to you, but I want you to think about it. Here's an example. He goes to give a speech in Iowa, and he's in the middle of farm dairy country, right? Milk cows, okay? And it's kind of cold that morning, and he gets introduced, and everybody's kind of chilly, and he says to the people, listen carefully, quote, I would like, as the cow said to the farmer, thanks for such a nice warm hand on such a cold, brisk morning. <laughs> and you know, it's not hilarious, but it's funny. That's what a president says. You know what I mean? If you're that milk cow and you're freezing and that guy comes to milk you, he's got nice warm hands and you get warmed up just like that, right? <laughs> that was his point. Okay, we'll move on to number 11. The Cuban Missile Crisis. This was the one that made up for the Bay of Pigs. And I'm going to go through this quickly because we're about out of time. The Cuban Missile Crisis was a time in which the Russians put nuclear missiles in Cuba. And we could not stand for that, kids, because they could target every city in the United States with the exception of Seattle, Washington. And so for 13 tense, stressful days, the president took pressure from the military to attack Cuba, knowing that if we attack Cuba, Soviets were going to invade Berlin. And then it was just going to go back and forth, and pretty soon what were we going to have? A nuclear holocaust, because everybody had nuclear weapons. So Kennedy used unbelievable patience, unbelievable grace, unbelievable stress management, and he talked and negotiated our, those missiles out of Cuba, and in, within a period of time, we were within two minutes of launching our nuclear missiles against Russia. It's a long story that if you get in this class, I'll tell you the whole story. It's a long story. But it was brilliant. He saved us. I'm telling you right now, if Kennedy does something wrong in the Cuban Missile Crisis, you might not be sitting where you're sitting, and I might not be giving you this lecture. Because we might not exist. So we'll talk about that if you get in the class. The twelfth reason you should care about the president's death is civil rights. He was the first president to try to deal successfully with civil rights. Did he have a lot of success? No. Why? Partially because he was assassinated, and there's a martyr, there is a martyr deal here. There's a martyr moment. You know what a martyr is? Someone that dies for a cause. Yeah. President Kennedy tried civil rights. He dealt with the Freedom Riders. He dealt with the University of Mississippi not letting in a black Air Force veteran into their college. He dealt with the University of Alabama not letting black students enroll in that college. He dealt with the assassination of Medgar Evers, the head of the Mississippi NAACP. He welcomed and encouraged Martin Luther King Jr. and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. But the thing Kennedy is most remembered for was his presidency during the March on Washington, in which Martin Luther King Jr. gave the speech that ended, free at last, free at last, 
thank God Almighty, we are free at last. One of the most famous speeches in American history was done on the steps of the, uh, the Lincoln Memorial. And that march on Washington was set forth to try to pass a civil rights bill that would end segregation in theaters, bus stations, restaurants, any businesses were discriminating against Negroes. I have a sign in my office, I forgot to bring it, that you put on a drinking fountain. Colored drink out of this fountain, whites drink out of this fountain. Bathrooms, colored only. Couldn't go to a restaurant and sit down and eat if you're black. Vince Lombardi, anybody heard of him? Vince Lombardi, greatest coach in NFL history, Green Bay Packers, who the Super Bowl trophy is named after, went into a, into a restaurant when he took his football team in the 1960s who had blacks and whites, right? Took him into a restaurant and said to the owner, do you serve blacks here? And the owner's response was, of course we do. How would you like him cooked? That was the philosophy. So coaches had to find separate hotels and separate places. John Kennedy was the first man to try to get that under control. The bill that he was trying to pass during the March on Washington, after he was assassinated, Lyndon Johnson, who succeeded him, was the first order of business was passed called the Civil Rights Act of 1964. That was President Kennedy's bill passed by President Johnson in honor of the president concerning civil rights. But more civil rights success was done under President Lyndon Johnson after Kennedy was assassinated than had ever been done or maybe would have done with Kennedy. And the final, kids, the final reason that you should care about the death of President Kennedy is his brutal assassination. 46-year-old man gunned down brutally in broad daylight, leaving his wife and two young children. Hit him right in the head. It was a brutal. And you'll get into that later. And there's such a story behind that and what happened and conspiracy theories. I will tell you this, I have been teaching this class for many, many years, 30, I do not believe and never will believe in a conspiracy that killed President Kennedy. Lee Harvey Oswald did it. Nobody wants to believe that a loser of that magnitude could actually kill the most powerful man in the world. But he did. And he had the means, he had the motivation, and he had the plan. And he did it. So I'm not a conspiracy theorist, and if you take the class, you will find that out. That is the 13 reasons why I think you should care about the death of President Trump. Can you guys say thank you to Mr. Dewey? Perfect time to do it.